you. All right, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so I just got here last night, so um, I should probably be asleep, right? So if I, ma if I make any mistakes, that's the problem, all right? Uh, and you can let me know. Anyway, I realize, all right, so this is, this is a map of Canada. I was just going to give you some introduction so you know where Vancouver is, at least, uh, for those people who don't have an uncle living in Vancouver already. Um, so this is a map of Canada up above the U.S. here. Uh, to a first approximation, this is what you need to know about Canada, is mostly it's cold most of the year round. But some of it's not cold, and that's where I live. I live in the wet part. So we have the wet part, and over here is Vancouver. And um, there's the capital, Ottawa. Uh, she's down there. She's very far away. And you should also know that this part is very flat, and all the mountain parts are here where I live. And this part is where they're speaking French. So I actually live in a bilingual country, and my kids can now speak French. I, I still don't speak French any better than I did when I was 15. Anyway, so, um, oh, I did, I got it, I got it, I got it. All right, no, okay, I'm, okay. So here is, is, if we zoom in a little bit on this, on where I live, you can see that I live here next to this big island called Vancouver Island, and Vancouver here is right, right here. And this is the border with the US here. And um, this is an aerial photograph. And you can see here the downtown part. This is Vancouver. This is Stanley Park, which is a very nice park. And up in the top of here, that's my office up there. So if we zoom in one more time, we kind of swing the view around. Now we're focusing. This is UBC. Actually, this is pretty old, because they built a whole village down here, more or less. But this is my building here. And uh, you can see the downtown in the background. And now, if we zoom in again, if you need to deliver a message to me, okay, just make sure it's firmly attached and you can probably get it through the window. All right. Okay, so other thing you need to, I mentioned Van Vancouver is pretty wet. So, yeah, here is a weather forecast starting from today or from last night. Uh, so you can see we're getting plenty of rain and the temperature is about 50% of what it is here. Oh, sorry, yeah, 50%. Okay, but occasionally it does get sunny, and then this was the introduction to my group. So this was most of the group last year when we went canoeing, and we had a wonderful time, and we all went swimming in this beautiful lake here. Um, and I'm going to mention a lot of the people here who did this work are in this photograph, and this is my friend from UBC, Mike Gold, and I'm going to talk about some experiments, and any experiments I talk about, they're done in more or less in collaboration with him and his lab. Okay, so I want to talk about immune cells, so I just need to give a little bit of background on immune cells before I get to stuff which is more or less generalizable to any cell. Okay, so what we all know about the immune system, right, is that it senses pathogens and it reacts to the pathogens. Okay, so how do immune cells make that decision? Well, it all has to go through surface receptors. So you have your immune cell, and on the surface of the immune cell, there'll be some receptors, and those particular receptors can bind on to different kinds of pathogens and detect their presence. I don't want to go into all the details of that, but it's really interesting. Um, so, for example, B cells, which you probably remember they produce antibodies, B cells have on their surface a B cell receptor. Well, actually, they have 50,000 identical B cell receptors. So the cell here, seen in an electron microscope picture, will have 50,000 receptors, proteins, yeah, de um, decorating its surface. And then, then if, if something binds to those uh, receptors, then the cell will become activated, and it'll start to divide and differentiate and eventually form plasma cells, and plasma cells are the ones that make antibodies. And the antibody goes out through your body, and it's the same thing that the cell stuck to in the beginning. It's the same thing that bound the receptors in the beginning. And then it coats the pathogens and labels them for destruction. That's the immune system do its job. So the thing, that, the thing I want to really emphasize today is not that we have these receptors or where these receptors come from, but we're going to talk about the mobility and organization of proteins on the surface of the cell. Okay? So on the surface of the cell, it turns out that these proteins, they're not fixed in, they're not fixed in place, which is what we thought in the 1970s. And they're not uniformly distributed, which is what we thought 25 years ago. Actually, they're moving around, and they're forming patterns on the surface of the cell. 
And this is related to the ability of the cell to detect things and for the receptors to produce a proper signal and lead to an immune response. Okay, so what do I mean by a signal? Um, well, this is blurry, but that's probably just as well, because here is the res this is the cell surface, and up here are the receptors. These are the receptors on the surface, and they're binding onto a pathogen up here. And then there's a, a whole wave of biochemistry which sits underneath. And I don't want to talk about that either, but I just want to give you the idea that the way that these molecules up here are organized in space, okay, and how they move around, and is, is, is would be nice if it wasn't quite so blurry. But the way, that they're, the way that they're organized in space actually plays a big role in their ability to, cause, to, to have successful cell signaling. Okay, so these things are important in terms of understanding um, the signaling process. Okay, I'm emphasizing B cells here, but if you're worried about T cells, the story for T cells is almost the same. Okay, so um, I wanted to tell you about three things today. I think we can be pretty confident that I will tell you about two things, because three things is going to take too long. Um, but basically, I wanted to tell you about single receptor tracking on live cells, and then what happens if we have two color receptor tracking. So basically, we can look at the interactions between receptors. And then the last thing I wanted to say was about um, super resolution imaging of receptors on fixed cells. Okay, so basically the parts one and two are about the mobility of surface receptors, and part three is about um, the, the positioning of them, how they, how they look in patterns when you just take a snapshot. Okay, and all of these things are done by this very smart postdoc who's working with me, uh, Libin. Libin. Libin was actually a grad student here in Bangalore for a brief time at um, NCBS. And then he got his PhD in Germany and ended up with working with me and with Mike uh, in Vancouver. Okay, all right, whoops. Okay, so single particle tracking or single receptor tracking. Okay, this is what it is. So this is what it looks like when you see the images coming out of the microscope. So what we've done here is we've labeled receptors on the surface of a cell. The cell has come down and is sitting on the microscope slide, and we're imaging it from underneath, okay? And we're using a kind of microscopy called turf microscopy, which only allows you to image right next to the glass, okay? So we're only imaging a very thin slice of the cell sitting right on top of the glass, okay? So we see these fluorescent objects, okay? Here are some objects, and it doesn't take too much imagination to see that they're moving around, okay? And then you can process and detect Object. So these red dots here are the we process to detect peaks in intensity, okay? and you can see those going around. And so you can convert this video into this picture. Well, basically, you convert that video into a spreadsheet where we have a number of particles, x positions and y positions across time slices. Okay, so each frame we have the position of a particle and we can tra and we can track it. Okay. So yeah, we identify the particles and we join the particles. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the scale here. Okay. So it's a little hard to tell the pixelation, but we we have 100 nanometer pixels. Okay, and we can localize the particles to within about 100, well, 50 to 100 nanometers. Okay, and the whole scale here will be the order of a few micrometers. So we have a 512 by 512 camera with 100 nanometer pixels. So. It should be five micrometers, I guess. No, it should be 50 micrometers, but then I've zoomed in. So it's probably about five micrometers square. Okay, so after the experiment is done, you have all these tracks, okay? And the game now is, what's the physical model that's underlying those tracks? Okay, so how can we process these tracks and get some information? So I wanted to play a game with you a little bit later on, but let's do it now. Okay, so, what do we see here? Is there anything, is there something about that track? Does this track look different than this one? Yeah, it does, right? I mean, this one is, I would say, is longer. You know, this, is, this, is, this one seems like, this molecule looks like it had somewhere to go, right? It's heading off over this way. Yeah. Okay, on the other hand, what about this one? Was it going somewhere? 
or even more particularly maybe this one here which really didn't move at all yeah so we can already start to distinguish different kinds of behavior in these okay so um, let me just ask you just just as a quick question are you math by the way are you math people or physics people physics and math in a mix what physical phenomena I mean what thing would you expect these particles to be doing Yes, thank you. Brownian motion, very good. Everybody gets one point. Okay, Brownian motion. Yeah. So, and this is this is what everybody thinks is these things should approximately be doing Brownian motion. Okay. So the question, which I'm going to look at in a lot of detail, is how do we fit this to Brownian motion? And then also talking about what other models might there be, and then how reliably can we distinguish those from from Brownian motion? Okay. All right. Okay. So just talking about the experiments for a second. This is, this is one way to label things, okay? So we have the receptors here on the cell, okay? And what you do is you take an antibody against the receptor. So this antibody has two binding sites, the fab fragments of the antibody, which would like to bind to the receptor here, okay, to the receptors. And we label just those fab fragments with Psi3. Psi3 is a fluorescent probe. And we bind, and then we put them in solution and they bind on, and they bind monovalently, okay, which is actually important because if you cross-link these guys, then they behave differently. Okay, so they bind monovalently, and then we watch them go around. Now, one of the problems, though, with using a molecule like Psi3 is that it bleaches. Okay, so over the course of the experiment, we're stimulating it with a laser to make it fluoresce, and during the experiment, it will bleach out. So let me just show you. If I repeat the movie, um, you can see it's quite bright to begin with. There's a lot of dots, and then as the movie progresses, you'll eventually see there are a few dots, okay? And this is, this is the molecules bleaching out. So basically, the, the fluorophore just gives up after a while, okay? But we have reasonable signal to noise, and we can still track this. This is, not, this is not a problem for us to track in the software, okay? So there's an alternative to uh, Psi3 called, oh, I apparently had a duplicate slide. Oh, no, this happened before. Nuts, okay, well, there's an alternative where we use quantum dots to label. Okay, what you have to imagine here, and I can see on my screen, <laughs> what you have to imagine is um, a bunch of much brighter objects than in the previous slide, and moving around and not bleaching. Okay, so they're big and they're bright, so we can easily track them, and we can actually track them more precisely. Um, but the problem with the quantum dots well, there's two problems. The first problem is they don't directly bind on to the antibodies. So what we do is we, we label the quantum dots with something called streptavidin, which likes to bind to biotin. Biotin goes on to the fab fragment, which goes on to the, anti which goes on to the surface receptor, okay? And then we hope that we get monovalent attachment and we don't get cross-linking. Because if two of these streptavidins bind onto two of these biotins labeled here, okay, then we're going to find um, we've cross-linked the receptor and there's going to be biologically much different behavior. and We don't want that. So we hope that. But the second thing, which you would also have noticed if you got to see this movie, which I like it better that you don't get to see it because you have to use your imagination. Um, the, the, if you got to see the movie, you would see these guys are moving much less than in the previous experiment. So basically, the Q dot is way bigger. It's a bulky thing and it has a great deal of trouble to get into the space underneath the cell and still move. So it actually gets sterically hindered. So people use Q dots, but they tend to use them in experiments where they're imaging on top of the cell. And we actually, we tried to use them on the bottom of the cell and we had all kinds of trouble from this and they didn't move properly. So we basically gave up on the Q dots. Um, but I thought I would just tell you about this way, which is, which is commonly in the literature. Okay. All right. So. Okay, so let's take now a bunch of tracks from an experiment. Okay, so here are some tracks from an experiment. Okay, and actually I have many such experiments, many, many such experiments. So, and if I just take each step, so I have a particle here and a particle here, and I call this a step. If I plot now the steps in X and Y, so each dot on this figure is one step from one, one thing, and I have 50,000 of them. So if it was brown in motion, what would you expect the distribution of steps to look like? Random, yeah, but what shape would this distribution have? Sorry? 
I can't hear you. I can't tell you you're wrong if I can't hear you. Gaussian, Gaussian thank you. Yes, Gaussian, you're right, good. All right, so you've got, we, we would expect it to be Gaussian. So it's a little hard to see if this thing is Gaussian from this picture, but if I turn it on its side and just look at, say, the x direction, then this is a histogram of the steps in x, and this is my Gaussian fit through that, and it's not terrible. It does look like there may be slightly too many particles that didn't take a step, but, you know, we could probably live with this. Okay, so I would say this is, roughly speaking, looking like Brownian motion, at least by this metric. Okay, so what, is, what does Brownian motion really mean? So we all talk about Brownian motion. Um, Brownian motion is a great model for, for, for one particular reason, and that reason is it has one parameter. It is a one parameter motion model. And I think that's the reason why Brownian motion or diffusion gets used so much in, in biophysical modeling, even when it's not necessarily 100% appropriate, is because there's one parameter to estimate. And so and we all know what it is, right? It's the diffusion coefficient, d. Okay, so what does that mean? We're taking the steps from a two-dimensional Gaussian, um, and the variance is four times the diffusion coefficient, times dt. dt here is the time between consecutive observations. Okay, and the thing is, though, that the having one parameter also comes with a price, and that price is that it's self-similar. In other words, the step lengths have to scale as, as time squared, okay? And that's the rule that gives you the one parameter model, and it tells you how you go from short times to long times. Okay. Um, physicists with fancy equipment have tracked particles at 50,000 hertz or 100,000 hertz, okay? And they've found deviations from Brownian motion. We're biologists, well, I guess biophysicists. I can only track things at 30 hertz or 50 hertz. I don't, I'm way above that scale, so I don't have to worry about deviations from Brownian, Brownian motion on the short time scale. Okay. So this is the challenge I think that the field of particle tracking really has, is to first of all fit the particle tracking data, um, for example, to Brownian motion, but then secondly, understand deviations from Brownian motion as well. Okay, and actually being able to statistically validly find deviations from Brownian motion, that's actually um, a challenge. Okay, so, so what I want to do now is just talk slightly historically, okay? So single particle tracking really started in the 1990s, okay? And in the 1990s, um, one, there was one tool that kind of came about for fitting um, particle tracking data, and that was called the mean square displacement plot. So I'm calling this the traditional approach, all right? This is your... This is your father's, or my father's, your grandfather's um, approach to fitting diffusion, okay? So here is a simulated track. This is Brownian motion, okay? This is a Brownian motion track where I just, in some arbitrary units, I said D is a half, and I have 150 steps, okay? So there's my track, and it's completely random, all right? So what you would do with this track is you would take every possible subtrack of a given length, Okay, and then you would plot the uh, you would plot the um, the mean of the square dis displacement. Okay, so let me explain that. So suppose I'm looking at tracks of length subtracts of length ten. So I would go and I would count forward ten steps. So from here to here, I would square that and store it, and then I would start off at the next point and I would go from there to there that distance and I would square it, and I would store that. And I keep going for every possible subtrack of length 10, and then I take the average of those. This is already seeming a little odd, right? <laughs> this is seriously what people did. And if you plot this now, so if you do this for, for all the tracks of length 10 and all the tracks of length 20 and so forth, then you can plot the mean square displacement as a function of the, of the track length. Make sense? I'm not going too fast, right? Does that make sense? So this is, this is the mean of the square of the total displacement as a function of how many steps we're including in all of the subtracts. And for my simulated data, I get something like this. Okay, and you plot this against n, and you can show mathematically that the slope of this thing should be four times d. Okay, so what's the slope of this thing? Well, the best fit line through this is 1.14, so that gives me d of 0.28. That's really bad because my simulated D was 0.5, okay. So the problem is, well, one, there's, there's several problems with this, but the main problem is, okay, which points on this 
on this plot here do I have most confidence in? These guys, right? Because I have many more samples down here. Yeah? So basically, I'm much more confident about these guys. And these guys out here, this is just noise, more or less, right? So I really shouldn't be including these. OK, so people realized this after about three or four years of doing these experiments. That's probably an exaggeration. Um, OK, so if I fit it just to the first 10 points, OK, then I get a much better estimate of the diffusion coefficient. That's what people started doing. They would only fit the first 10 points. Okay. The reason they only fit the first, so, so, so the, sorry, the question is, why did they still make it 10 and not 8, or 6, or 2, or 1? Okay, why, why are they still trying to fit many points? It's because they're afraid of noise in their data. But that, what they're really afraid of is that they're not able to calculate how the noise should affect the measurement. Okay, so let me just, um, let me show you the, people, people found that the short time MSD was a good estimator for the diffusion coefficient. Okay, um, and then I just want to make a historical aside, and then I'll show you some, math show you some mathematics. And then what I'm going to show you is you should only consider the first point in the MSD plot. You don't need to do the whole plot. You just take the first point. Um, there was an enormous amount in the literature where people would get a small number of particle tracks and observe that the thing looks concave down, uh, that MSD, the mean square displacement as a function of time, was concave down. Now, what do you call that if the mean square displacement is concave down? You guys are too young to know this, I guess. But it was called anomalous diffusion. Have you heard about anomalous diffusion? Yeah, you're not too young. <laughs> but anomalous diffusion was a big thing when people started doing these experiments. Um, and it, essentially, anomalous diffusion is any time that this plot is, is downwards. Um, and there's lots of reasons why this plot would be downwards. One thing is the cell is finite. So you can't have a big displacement. Your experimental apparatus is finite. You just can't get big displacements. So eventually, it has to be concave down. Yeah? Um, and a lot of papers from the late 1990s, early 2000s, are really trying to grapple with this question of what, what do the shapes of these curves mean? Well, my, my opinion is the shapes of these curves don't really mean very, a very great deal, and primarily because it's all noise out here. There's no signal really hiding in this part. And if you're really trying to look at the shape of the curve, you should only be looking at the early part, and even then it's quite noisy. Okay. All right, so let's... Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, so if you, if I give you one, one, the bottom line is, if I give you one particle track, you can tell me almost nothing, because it's random. So it could just as easily just never go anywhere, or it could go a long way. And it's very hard to, on the basis of one track to distinguish that. What I'm going to tell you is the, the best you can do with one track, but really what you want to do is take many hundreds of tracks and do some averaging to get rid of this effect. So even with random data, you can say very little from one track, very little indeed, because it's random. So you have, you have one, ran, one realization of a noisy process tells you very little. You have to average many of them together. Yeah. OK, so while I, was, while I was explaining that, you guys read these equations and agreed with them, right? OK, so basically you can write down the likelihood of a diffusion coefficient given an observation. So if the observations are, this is my first displacement, R1, my second displacement, R2 from my track. These are the points in the track, right? The, the displacements in the track. OK, then the likelihood of the diffusion coefficient for any one of them is basically a Gaussian. So you can turn the likelihood around so it's a Gaussian in the diffusion coefficient, okay? And then they're all independent steps for Brownian motion. So the overall likelihood should just be to multiply these things together. Actually, that's probably a probability at the moment, but I'm always a bit worried about normalization, so I always write likelihood. Okay, so you, because these things are all dependent, uh, are all exponential, you can sum them up instead of multiplying them. And then I can take the log, and I get some kind of constant, and some terms here involving the time step and the diffusivity, the number of observations, and the step lengths. Okay? If I differentiate that with respect to d, the diffusion coefficient, and then I can maximize the log likelihood, which is the same as maximizing the likelihood, and get an equation like this, and end up with my maximum likelihood estimator for d would be the mean square displacement divided by four times the time step. Okay, That's just what it is. Okay, now I made a comment earlier that people were always worried 
about what, what, what happens if there's noise in the measurement. Okay? So we don't have perfect localization of the particles. There's always 50 nanometers of error here or something like this. So what if, the, what if there's noise? Well, if there's Gaussian positional noise in each observation, and by the way, what I really want to know is the error in the step lengths, not in the observations, but it's almost the same thing. If there's Gaussian positional noise of variance s squared, I'm oh, sorry, 2s squared, corresponding to an error of s, standard deviation s in both x and y, then basically that just comes in and, 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 and gets built into the Gaussian from the diffusive step. Okay? So if I have, if I have this, okay, then you can see that the s squared just basically comes into the calculation when I take the exponents together, then I do the same thing. I differentiate, I set it equal to zero, I find the maximum. And what you get is your maximum likelihood estimated for the diffusivity is what it was before, the sum of square displacements diffusivity estimate, and then actually the particle is, is actually, the maximum likelihood tells you it's actually going a bit slower than that. Okay, because even if you have a stuck particle that's not moving at all, errors in your measurements will make it look like it's moving. Yeah, so you should have a, a correction which makes this a little bit smaller. Okay, or if you like, the maximum likelihood estimate of diffusion should be the sum of square displacements estimate minus this correction for the noise. Okay, and this actually lets me do something kind of fun. So what I can do now is I can go into the lab, or rather I can tell Libin to go into the lab, stick some particles down and track them and figure out what's the error in our imaging system, okay? Because if I have a particle that's really not moving, this is zero, yeah, I can see what I measure as my diffusivity and then that's just, because that's zero, what I measure is just equal to this function of the noise. So I can figure out what's the error in my imaging system. And not just imaging, imaging, particle extraction and tracking. So I can get the overall error in my experimental system this way. Okay, so I did that, and there's another movie that you guys don't get to see, but uh, basically, oh, this is, this is what one frame of one particle, this is what one frame looks like of a movie of a stuck particle. So the particle is somewhere in here, and you can see the brightest point is here, and then it's got some noise around it, okay? Um, we, fit, we fit a Gaussian to this to figure out the most likely position where this particle is, okay? And then we track that Gaussian over time, okay? And then by using sum of square displacements for this, we can basically figure out what is, so this is the apparent diffusivity of a stuck one micrometer bead. It has an apparent diffusivity in our imaging system of this many micrometers squared per second. And I can convert that into the error in my image. So I have a 14 nanometer standard deviation of error in X and in Y, which is pretty good, right? 14 nanometers is quite small. Yeah, I, I'm happy with that. That's for a big bright bead. For a quantum dot, which isn't quite so bright, I have about, my, my spatial accuracy is about 50% uh, worse. And for a fab, for, a fluorescent, for an antibody with an a organic fluorescent dye stuck to it, I, I do it a little bit worse again, okay? But I can use these now, um, sort of to, this is sort of calibrating my whole imaging and tracking system, okay? I can also find a critical diffusion coefficient that I can't measure so I can't measure anything slower than the noise threshold, right? So if the thing is not moving any faster than the noise floor, I can't measure it, and that comes out to be about, well, a small number of micrometers squared per second, but at 30 frames a second, there's no way I could measure something that slow anyway. Okay. All right. Oh yeah, here's my quiz. I kind of gave the answer away. So the quiz was, uh, here are some tracks. Which ones exhibit, which one is the pure diffusive track? Which one has directed motion? Which one has a particle which is transiently being captured? And which one exhibits some sort of barrier? The bottom one is pure diffusion. You like this one as pure diffusion? Sorry? You think that one's pure diffusion? Yeah. Um, which one? You think that's pure diffusion? Okay. Which? All right. So we've got some candidates for pure diffusion. What about the blue one? Directed. Okay. Which one is transient capture? 
So it gets captured and then released. It get, when it's captured, it can't move, or it moves slowly. The central one? This one? Yeah. How about this? It was like it was captured here, and then it was released, and then it was captured here. Yeah. All right. Some of you are already smiling, right? You know what's going on here. These are all, I simulated all of these. These are all pure diffusion, okay? <laughs> all right? And I just want you to know, I ran it in Mathematica. I did not, well, it's not quite true. I, get, I, I, found, I simulated 20, and I pulled out from 20, what is it, seven or eight of them here, just to make sure that I got one that looks like this. <laughs> okay. All right. Biologists... Um, have a bit of a tendency when they get particle tracking data to find patterns in it, even though it's completely random, okay? So a biologist, if he found tracks, if he found more than two or three tracks like this out of 100, might start to think that the particles were actually being moved around by some molecular motor or something like that, yeah. We have to be very careful in this field not to overinterpret the data because we're dealing with noise. I mean, diffusion is noise, right? So to find patterns is noise is... We shouldn't do it, but on the other hand, we all know, right, if on a dark night, if you go walking in the woods, you, your, your mind will find things to look at, right? Humans are very good at finding patterns in, in pictures like this. Okay. All right. So I guess you all fail the quiz. But, uh, okay. This is really the point, is your analysis really is no good on, on a single track basis, Okay. It's no good on a single track basis. So you have to work over many tracks. Okay. So now I'm going to move on and tell you about something um, that we did a few years ago. We, we decided what we wanted to try to do was rather than just fitting to pure diffusion, we decided we wanted to say what happens if particle behavior changes within one track. Okay. And can we get some insights into behavior of objects? Okay. And then in particular, can we probe protein interactions using particle tracking? So this was work I did with um, Chris Cairo, who's a professor in chemistry in Alberta, um, and Dodo Das. Uh, there's an Indian theme to this talk, right? And Dodo Das was a postdoc with me. Uh, he went to um, uh, IISC Delhi. Does that make sense? Does IISC Delhi make sense? I think that's where it is. Anyway, but he, was a, he, he came over and he was a postdoc with me. Um, okay, so I'm going to have to tell you a little bit of biology. So now we're on a T cell, not a B cell. Um, LFA is an integrin on the T cell. So LFA will bind to um, the extracellular matrix. Okay? And what's really interesting about LFA is it has two different conformations. So it can be in a closed conformation where it will not bind, and then the cell can do some magic and it will be in an open conformation and it can bind onto the ECM, okay? Okay, LFA is also known to interact with the actin cytoskeleton of the cell. Are we good on actin cytoskeleton? Should I just briefly? Cells uh, underneath the membrane of the cell, there is an array of actin, I'm, I'm just trying to help everybody out, there's an array of actin filaments, okay, that form kind of a mesh, and I've sort of schematically drawn the mesh here with these lines, and it helps give the shell, a, uh, helps give the cell kind of a stiffness and a shape. And the cell can dynamically change the shape of the actin and push out and pull in and do things like this, okay? But for, for the purposes of today, it's just something that the LFA will interact with. So the LFA is on the outside of the cell up here, and on the inside of the cell, it can interact with the actin cytoskeleton, okay? And then we can give the cell a drug called cytochalasin, which messes with the actin cytoskeleton in such a way that you'll probably destroy this interaction, okay? So that's what we need to know, okay? All right, so Chris, Chris had previously done single particle tracking on LFA on live T cells, and he published a paper on it. Um, so let me just quickly, this is, this is the main figure from that paper, so let me quickly talk you through it. Okay, so these are the particle tracks. Okay, so let's just look at the control cells. Now, these are the particle tracks, and you can see some of them are kind of small and confined, and he drew those in green, and some of them are kind of bigger, and he drew those in blue. So how did he get to that point? What he did was he fit, using MSD, using MSD analysis like I just showed you, he fit a single diffusion coefficient for the whole track, okay, for each track in turn, and he made a histogram. So 
the B is, is the controls. That's a histogram of the diffusion coefficients from these tracks, okay? All right, so th this guy would have a large diffusion coefficient because it went a bit longer, and this guy would have a low coefficient because it, it didn't go very far. He made a histogram of that, and then what he did was he said, that histogram looks too wide. I'm gonna s divide it into sub-histograms where I, I basically do a two-component decomposition of that histogram yeah, into a high and a low normal distribution. So you can see the black curve is the whole thing, and then he broke it up into green and blue. Okay, and then if, if you were drawn from the green distribution, then you come over here and you're painted green. If you're drawn from the blue distribution, then you're painted blue over here, all right? Okay, um, and then he did experiments with cytochalazine D. So he messed with the cytoskeleton of the cell and that presumably meant that the LFA molecule didn't have anything to interact with and so it would move more freely most of the time. Okay, and so he found more of the particles had higher diffusion coefficients. Um, and then he did, PMA is an activator of the cell, okay, and you can see it didn't make quite as much difference, right? So these are just drugs that you can give to the cell. Okay, so when, when, when we saw this data, it, we, we saw this as a great test set for the idea of trying to probe, do the particles, or do, do, the, do the proteins that are being tracked, do they, um, do they always behave the same way, or do we see some where there are transitions between fast and slow? In other words, in particular with the cytoskeleton, can we figure out the particle is moving freely, oh, and now it's bound to the cytoskeleton, and now it's moving freely again after it unbound. So can we find those kind of transitions in this data? So that's what we decided to go after. And we decided to go after it with a kind of model um, called the hidden Markov model. Okay, so we have this, some of you probably know about HMMs. So this is a hidden Markov model. Um, so we've got the fluorescent particle in yellow, that's that big yellow thing. Okay, and basically the idea is sometimes it's moving fast and it draws its diffusive steps from a wide distribution and then it can transition to taking steps from a narrower distribution so it would be moving slower, okay? So we could have a couple of smaller steps here, okay? And then it would unbind from whatever it was stuck to and we would go back to drawing the steps from the wide distributions, okay? So the idea is we, we can kind of the schematic of the model is you have two different diffusive states and then you have probabilities of transition for moving back and forth between them, okay? Or if you like, rates of transition. It's probabilities if you think of this on a per frame basis, but it's rates if you allow that those frames are separated by a fixed time step, okay? So this is called a hidden Markov model because we observe the particle displacements. What we don't know is which state the particle is in, okay? So we get to observe some sort of representative of, of, of this, but we don't get to really see, see the state the particle is in. Now, hidden Markov models are very popular in communication theory, and there was a whole bunch of nice work in the 60s and 1960s and 1970s um, to do with decoding, you know, suppose somebody is sending you Morse code, right? So you don't know, what's hidden from you is, is this a Morse code, right? Dots and dashes? or maybe I should say binary code ones and zeros. So you don't know what you're getting, one, zero, zero, one, one. All you get to observe is the corrupted version that comes down your communication channel, okay? But if you have an idea of how your communication channel works, analogously, you have an idea of how diffusive steps work, then you can basically do what I'm about to do with this uh, to reconstruct your, the, the, the message in Morse code or in binary code. All right, so this is maybe a little much, but it's not so different from the formula I showed you before. Basically, what we've got here is the likelihood of the observations of, motion, of steps given the four parameters, which are the two diffusivities and then the transition rates, transition probabilities, okay? And you can see it's some sum over, so this is the function I showed you before, which is the likelihood of a diffusivity given a step. Okay, so the step would be the observation here, okay, and then that's the likelihood of the diffusivity. So you have the likelihood, um, which can be according to which state J you're in, you can be in state one, state two, you have your observation set, which is I going from one up to N, okay, and then 
you have which state are you actually in? Those are the queues. So Q1 up to QM, that's the state that you're that potentially in. Okay, so we can calculate the likelihood function in this way. And then coming from this whole array of literature from the 60s, there's something called the forward-backward scheme, which means I don't have to evaluate this sum over every possible combination of, you know, state one, state two, state one, state two, or state two, state two, state two, state one. Okay, I only have to evaluate it. Basically, you kind of go through the data forward and you go through the data backward and you multiply the two things together. And it's a very efficient way of doing this. It's much more efficient in terms of operations. Anybody who, the Wikipedia, the Wikipedia page on this is amazingly informative. It's a beautiful thing, okay? So if you haven't looked at this, you should, you should some point, someday. Anyway, so we can use a forward-backward scheme to optimize this. It's just a numerical, just a tool for optimizing it, okay? And then right, we can calculate the likelihood through the forward-backward, and then we optimize using a thing called NCMC, which is basically you come up with some parameters, you calculate the likelihood, did they go up or down? If, if, it, if, it, if the likelihood went up, you accept them. If it went down, most of the time you reject. Sometimes you, you, get, you, sometimes you accept, prevent yourself from getting stuck in local minima. Okay. So we tested this method out using some simulated data. So what I'm showing here is data which we simulated from a two-state model, okay, which is analyzed in this column uh, in the old way, how Chris was analyzing his data before, and over here analyzed in the new way. Okay, so the top row is just one test set. Um, this middle row, we're kind of trying to trick our method. We're giving it single diffusion coefficient. Okay, so we're giving it data drawn from a single diffusivity. So there's no transitions here. We want to see if it would break. And it didn't break, it put the two diffusivities right on top of each other. We got complete garbage for the transition probabilities, of course, but it didn't, it worked. Okay, so for simulated data, this method does what I claimed it would do, and it, it's able to separate out the two different diffusive states when they're present, as in the top row or in the bottom row. Okay. All right, and then we applied it to Chris's, um, Chris's uh, data from LFA on T cells. Okay, so it's obviously suicide in a talk like this to present a table of data, okay? Um, but, uh, I, I mean, I might as well just say at this point, it was interesting and we got some interesting insights, okay? I can stop now, right? I don't have to go through all the insights we got, because you guys don't really care about this, but um, let's see. If we, if we look in the, the data in the red box here, basically, Applying cytochalasin, so disrupting the actin cytoskeleton, didn't much change the free and confined diffusivities. These numbers stay about the same in these two rows. But what it did was it shifted the, um, it shifted the equilibrium towards the faster state by changing the transition probabilities. So the stuck to the actin cytoskeleton versus free from it states didn't really change, but we did find a change in, in how likely you were to be stuck to it. Okay. That's, that's the interpretation there. Um, PMA sort of activates the cells in a non-receptor-specific manner, and, and that actually did appear to change things quite a bit. And we have a theory about this as well, but I, I think I might just skip that one. Okay. One of the nice things about this kind of analysis, too, is you can also try to reconstruct the state sequence. So there's a thing called Viterbi algorithm where if you have all your transition probabilities and diffusivities, you can reconstruct the sequence. So we can take a track, this is actually simulated. This is a simulated two-state track and we can reconstruct it into slow and fast moving parts. Okay, so this is the true, and this is the true sequence where red is fast and blue is slow, and this is the reconstruction. Okay, so you can, for simulated data, we're able to reconstruct. For real data, obviously we, we can't do this comparison because we don't know what the true state sequence is, but, um, whoops, I don't even know where that went. But, <laughs> but um, we get some interesting, I mean, this, this, this track, for instance, is mostly in the slow state, but occasionally transitions to the fast state here. And this guy is mostly in the fast state, but you can see that it's occasionally binding. And this, this led to all kinds of additional thoughts that we haven't fully followed up, okay. Anyway, 
Yeah, so particle tracking, so I, I just showed you one thing that we did, and we're not the only people to try to do this. There have been other models which are broadly similar to what we did um, in the literature. Um, but the challenge for particle tracking analysis, well, first of all, is getting your tracks correct. That's actually a challenge that I haven't addressed today. Um, but then you have to think about what kind of information do I want to get out of these tracks, and then I think importantly, how can I statistically validly get it out and not just be fitting noise, basically, not, not be just, not even fitting noise, just, not just getting noisy, uh, um, sorry, not just uh, taking basically random tracks and trying to find patterns in them. I, I need to have a way of statistically doing this so that it's, so that it's done validly. Okay. All right. And then also, and this, is, this is a whole lecture series or class in itself. Um, understanding how these methods, how particle tracking would interact with super resolution microscope, microscopy, for example. Okay, because the results don't always appear to be consistent. Okay, all right, well, that was uh, 45 minutes on part one. Um, so, uh, what do you want to hear about? Two color receptor tracking or, or storm imaging? You want to hear about storm? Okay, well, he, he spoke up first. Uh, yeah, the two-color study is, is, uh, is sort of interesting, but I don't have any punchline. Like, we have all this data and we don't know what to do with it, so I was just going to show you stuff that I tried to do, which kind of partially works. So it's probably just as well we'll go on to STORM, and I'll just try to give you a sense of what STORM is, and uh, what STORM is, and then some things that we are trying to do about STORM to make it a little bit better for everybody. Okay, so. Optics 101, right? You can't resolve a part, an object which is smaller than the diffraction limit of what you're imaging it with. So this is why we have X-ray and electron microscopy, is because electrons have a smaller wavelength than, than visible light, okay? However, photons from a point source, so if you have a point source of light, then if they go past through your imaging system, they're gonna come out in an airy function shape. Okay, now and an airy function, by the way, is almost the same as a Gaussian, so I'll probably use the terms interchangeably. Okay, so if I'm imaging, say, a point source, and over here I have my detector with pixels on it, then if I get enough photons from that source and I detect them on the different pixels of my receptor, of my, um, of my camera, then if I reconstruct a Gaussian or an airy function according to the distribution of those photons, and I take the peak of that, I may be wrong, but that is the most likely position of where that particle was, okay? And that's, that's the core of super-resolution microscopy, is taking a bunch of photons and reconstructing a Gaussian to estimate the most likely position of where the particle was, okay? So it's, if, given that it's so simple that I can explain it in 20 seconds, it's a bit shocking that there was three Nobel Prizes for this uh, two years ago, right? Anyway. Okay, so here's the problem with bi biological imaging, is most of the time, in the old days at any rate, people would label at high density, and so you would see all the objects together and there's no way you could separate the objects apart. Okay, so the trick with super resolution imaging is we only image one fluorescent object at a time, or a small number, and they're spatially separated so they're not interfering with each other. Okay, and there are three main techniques that people talk about for super resolution, um, Stead, Palm, and Storm. Again, Wikipedia is highly informative, and I'm gonna describe Storm because that's the one that we're doing. Um, the other two are equally interesting and, and not terribly different. So the idea with Storm is the following, is you take your cell, you label what you wanna see at a high density. So you can see here the gray dots, those are where the particles actually are. But if, they were all, if, if the labels were all switched on at one time, all you would see is this red cloud. So what you do is you stochastically wake up a few of the dots each time, and you localize their positions. So in the first round, you wake up these four guys, and they give you dots here. In the second round, you wake up these guys, and they give you dots here, and so on and so forth, until eventually, if you take all the dots, and put them together, you get back the image you want, okay? And this is, you can see, is a very high resolution image compared to the cloud that you would have got if you just looked at them all at once, okay? Or you can look at it this way. 
This is um, an imaging of microtubule network in a pretty, pretty big flat cell. Um, and you can see it's kind of blurry, OK, because you don't have good resolution because everything is switched on at once. So then with storm imaging, what you can do is image just a few of the fluorophores at a time and then stack the, put this together and you get back a much more precise image of the local, of the positions of each thing, yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you get the weak and how does it determine which ones it is? Why is it the same? Well, yeah, the S is stochastic. So you, oh, you, they're switched on at random, they, they come on at random. So you, you tickle them with the laser. The fluorophores get tickled by the laser, and only a few of them will switch, will, will oh, reach, okay. will so reach the active the state. Top, then there's only a low probability that yeah. it's Yeah. So if you just take your bright cell and just turn your laser down, assuming you've got good imaging and you're able to then, to, to, to do post-processing to get the localizations, then, then you can do storm. It's not actually that complicated. Okay. Um, now, at UBC, we have a bespoke storm system. This is all complicated stuff, but the only reason I put this slide in is when you've got the drift correction switched on, this is the X, this is for a stuck particle. This is the X position that we're detecting, and this is the Y position, and this is the Z position. And if you flip that red line on its side, you can see that we're localizing to within sort of a four nanometer box in X and a four nanometer box in Y, and about a 12 nanometer box in Z. So this, this, is, the, this is the beautiful thing, is we're, Im we're imaging down to extremely high resolution here, okay? So if we apply this now to the B cells, we're back to B cells, okay, so we're looking at the B cell receptors, then we get this beautiful pattern on the cell, so this is the whole cell, uh, this is 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5. So this, these are the numbers of microns. So we have a cell which is about 5 microns in, radio, in diameter. And we get this beautiful localization of the receptor patterns. And you can see, I mean, what do you, what's the first word that comes to mind? It's, it's clustered, right? You see these clusters. Okay. Um, and if we zoom in, we can, obviously, this is a reconstructed image, so we can zoom in as much as we want. If we zoom in, you can see these little clusters here of receptors. Now, everybody, not just about everyone in the field, reports these things and says there's a cluster. And there's an implicit assumption there that each one of these dots is a separate receptor or a separate fluorescent object. And that is not necessarily the case. Okay, because there's absolutely no reason why one of your fluorescent labels couldn't switch on now in frame four, and in frame 285, switch on again, and so on and so forth. And what's tricky is, when it switches on in those two different times, because there's a lot of noise in the position, we could be finding it here and then finding it here. And then maybe it switches on again in frame 6,000 and we're getting it over here, okay? now. Um, I only have two minutes left to go, so I'll just briefly say we're trying to address that problem through a hidden Markov model, okay? So, oh yeah, this is just explaining. Okay, so here's, here's my whole cell again. Looking at one little cluster, we see this. And so this is the spatial information, which is what everybody always reports. These are where the dots have been found. Okay, this is the temporal information. And it actually continues off the end of the slide here. Okay, so this is when they're switching on. Okay, so this is the temporal information, this is the spatial information. No one appears to be, I shouldn't be too strong. I hope nobody else is using this information because if they are, then our paper's gonna be published in the Journal of Dubious Biophysics and I'm hoping it gets published in a really good journal. <laughs> but um, when we finish this, I'm hoping it's gonna be really good. Um, so just to summarize, uh, what, what we're doing is we assume that each fluorescent tag follows identical kinetics. So basically, most of the time it sits in the dark state. Periodically it wakes up and we can see it, and then it might go back to sleep again, back to the dark state. So it can do transitions like this between A and D. And then occasionally it will bleach completely. We know that the things bleach because if you look in frame one, you'll have a few hundred localizations. If you look in frame 5,000, you'll have 20 localizations. So we're definitely losing fluorophores over the course of the, of the thing. So this is our temporal model for each fluorophore, okay? And then, okay, so, so the concept here is the real location is at the red dot, 
And then every time it switches on and we localize it, we see green dots around like this. Okay, so this would be what we would see, but the true position is here. So this is, essentially this means it's, uh, we can look on the whole problem in the spatial sense as a Gaussian mixture model. So each fluorophore is generating a Gaussian distribution of, of localizations, and we have a bunch of them mixed together. And then we simultaneously have a temporal model for them switching, for them switching on and off. Um, so yeah, temporal model, the, the, the spatial model, mixture of Gaussians model, Likelihood, we assume space and time are independent, and they probably are, okay? The likelihood is just one model times the other model, basically. And then we can go ahead and try to look at maximizing um, the, the negative log, or minimizing the negative log likelihood over all the parameters. And the interesting thing is you also have to minimize over how many fluorophores are there in the cluster that you're looking at. And that's what makes it tricky, actually, because you have a combined continuous and discrete optimization problem that you're, that you're trying to solve. And that's fine maybe for one patch, because how many fluorophores are there? There were the six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 of them. But then the second patch you look at, you've now got sort of a chessboard to look at. And then the third patch, you need, so the dimensionality can get quite high. And we're working now on ways to optimize uh, high dimensional discrete, uh, in, in a high dimensional discrete sense. Okay. And it kind of works, <laughs> but I don't really have time to show you. But this is definitely work in progress. Um, and the other thing we did in the last minus two minutes is we just looked at spatial statistics of, of, of point data. So this old thing called the Hopkins Index, which has been kicking around since the 1950s for classifying whether they, spatial data is clustered or not clustered. So we applied that, and Ripley functions, which are from the 1970s, and other stuff, and then we came up with our own method, and we gave it this cool name, which is StormGraph. And StormGraph is a, um, essentially you replace all the points with a graph, and then you do neighborhood detection in the graph like the computer scientists do. Okay, so if anyone knows anything of neighborhood detection, you can imagine if you don't, well, we convert it into a graph and then look for neighborhoods in the graph. And uh, this is where we're really computer scientists because computer scientists will never publish, um, sorry, computer, where'd it go? Computer scientists will never publish a paper where their method doesn't do better than all previous methods. And so we are exactly like them in that we are able on simulated data to show that our method exceeds all previous public methods on the problem of detecting clusters in a noisy back. Anyway. Sorry, I'm always proud to say that, and I'm glad I'm being videoed. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> okay, so to summarize, uh, modern imaging opens the window on individual protein level functioning of healthy and diseased cells. And I think that you should, this, all this work has to be done in context of a valid biophysical model that we can reproduce things. Um, and I also think that it's important for when you're designing your experiment to think of um, the model as part of the design. So thinking about how, the, how you're going to get out the parameters you want. How many experiments do you need to do? Um, how re, how um, strong does your fluorophores have to be to give you enough tracks to do the statistics you want to do? And then, I didn't talk about this at all, but one thing I'm really interested in is then generating signaling models from this kind of data. Thank you for your attention. Can you say that again? Sorry. No, they're, they're dead. And they're dead. They come out of the mouse. So, uh, can you somehow like uh, fix the cells so that you reduce the noise, and uh, when you do storm imaging, you put so the receptors, the clusters that you get, you can actually point out where the receptors are if the cell is not moving. The cell is not moving. This cell is, is, has been frozen. I mean, yeah. um, and what do you do for the drift correction, the thermal variation? Okay, we, we do, the drift correction is done in the, in the hardware. 
Okay, so we have fiduciary beads, which are sitting on the slide, and we tell the microscope, and we tell the computer, right, that these are beads, and I need you to keep those beads, because beads are very bright, they're always fluorescing, right? Um, I need you to keep those beads exactly aligned through the experiment. Okay, so the cell is not drifting, um, because we are doing state, the, the stage is being corrected by a stepper motor through, through the whole experiment. I will admit, I've never actually seen the instrument, <laughs> but that's, that's how it works, okay. So if you go, by the way, if you go and buy a storm, a storm microscope, you'll have drift like crazy. Um, I think there's some kind of PID controllers. Some kind of what? There is a kind of PID controller, proportional and degradative. PID. PID. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, the, the, these are the storm. We're doing the storm on fixed cells, so they're dead, and hopefully the receptors are stuck in place. If the receptors are still moving in the fixed cell then this is all a bit dubious at that point. We, we know they move a little. But, you know, it's the best you can do, right? So you uh, uh, showed actually S values of quantum dots and one micrometer beads. And those were 29 mic nanometer and 40 nanometer. So uh, what was the difference actually, the mass or what intrinsic property was changing that S value? Yeah, so, so in that situation, right, the, we stick it down. We put it on the slide and we dry it. So it should be stuck in place and just not moving. Um, the, the, the bead is so bright. We get many, many photons, so we get extremely good localization. Uh, so the bead, it comes out and it hits the detector and it's hitting the pixels, and then we, look, we, we fit a Gaussian around the bead, right? Around the pixels. Because it's so bright, the statistics are really good, and the center of that Gaussian is very, very still. I mean, it just moves around within one pixel, right? With the other extreme cases, the antibody, because it's not so bright, you have few photons and it's sort of doing this. If we, if we extend, instead of working at 30 hertz, if we went to one hertz, we would do better with the thing. But we want, but we want to work at 30 hertz when the things are moving, so that's the, the comparison we should make, right? Yeah. Can I ask two more questions? Uh, so, uh, so you, you uh, so the rate D one, D two, the mobilities. Yeah. So that you were trying to know the how much time it will be uh, taking to go from one state to another state, or yes. the rates, uh, how much proportion uh, of two different different uh, materials will be there? Yeah. yeah. So what uh, uh, A or B? I mean, so. uh, well, we can do both, right? So, so once you have the rates, that tells you the equilibrium. Distance. So both can be. No. Yeah. Um, it probably is not in thermal equilibrium. I mean, the, the cell is alive, so the cell can certainly be burning some energy to move its move things around. Um, what we what we implicitly hope is that that's not very important. However, um, a follow up project. My grad student um, did the following model: is the particle can transition between a diffusive state, so it's not being driven, and a driven state, where it's moving for short distances in a straight line. We took that model. It fits the simulated data beautifully, as you would expect. But when we went to the real data, we never found any evidence for the driven state in any of the data that we had. And that made it very hard to publish. <laughs> so it's just sitting in her thesis still. We don't know what to do. One day, maybe we'll find some driven data and we can publish it. But we sent it to Biophysical Journal. Biophysical Journal sent it back, and the reviewer comments were, this is all very interesting, but unless you have experimental data, you know. Yeah. And what was the reason 